We do not intercept Canadians or look at their other activities or anything else so that we don't have a situation where we're ever doing that. Hi, this is Captain Adam Morton with the Canadian Army Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about the Canadian Combat Support Brigade, or CCSB, and electronic warfare. With me in Kingston is Warrant Officer Chris Price. Welcome to the podcast. Good day. Hi. All right, so uh, first thing we usually kick off with is, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, well, I'm a mem reserve member of 21 Electronic Warfare. I actually joined in 1989, so I've been a member of the Electronic Warfare Unit all that period as I've gone through. Um, during that time, I've uh, been to Germany. I've been uh, deployed in Afghanistan a couple of times in Electronic Warfare roles. And uh, I've spent a whole bunch of time working in different sort of subspecialties in Electronic Warfare. So we're kind of talking about the Combat Support Brigade, or CCSB. It's a relatively new organization that's been stood up recently under 5DIV. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that is and what you guys do? So CCSB is a mixed regular and reserve brigade. So it's a regular force brigade, but it has in it about 20% or more of, of the, the subunits are actually made up of reserve components. It's done to put all the different enablers together so that we have a, a sort of single brigade to put together the pieces. It looks after uh, a lot of the intelligence work and a lot of the sort of support to command parts that uh, we need. So that's the Canadian Combat Support Brigade. And you're talking about enablers. What kind of enablers fall under that? So it's made up of five main parts. Uh, there is 21 Electronic Warfare Regiment. There's the CARE, which is the Canadian Army Intelligence Regiment. There is IETF, which is the Influence Activities Task Force that has the PSYOPs and the CIMIC capabilities. As well, it has a fourth ESR, which is the Engineer Support Regiment, which is Canada's sort of high readiness uh, engineering unit. As well as it has the 4th Artillery Regiment, which is the uh, General Support Regiment for Artillery for the Canadian Forces and has things like UAVs and uh, the uh, radar. So that's like a pretty wide spectrum of different capabilities. It certainly is, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about Electronic Warfare, or EW. Electronic Warfare, 21 EW, uh, stood up as a regiment in uh, 2010. And uh, Electronic Warfare are the things that we do to collect the enemy's activity in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum. 21 EW's specific role is to force generate forces to work in electronic warfare and signals intelligence. Uh, we do that with uh, a number of different trades and units and pieces. Uh, but the thing that people most know us for is, is putting out what we call mutes and loots, uh, which are mobile and light electronic warfare detachments that uh, collect the enemy's information and report on it to other people. And what does that look like when you're out in the field? Like you're out there doing army stuff. What kind of equipment do you use? How does that, how does that look like when you're in operations? So it can be quite varied. So it goes from everything such as uh, radio reconnaissance, which can be people with a tablet and special radios and a backpack, um, all the way up to uh, people who are working in something which is a mute, a role people might be more familiar from from Afghanistan, uh, where they see a bison armored vehicle uh, suited out with a series of different electronic warfare suites uh, to collect and report and uh, pass information out. Do you have a lot of experience with the other elements within the CCSB? I have a fair bit of experience with uh, some of the other ones. I've spent a lot of time working uh, as a rep for electronic warfare or influence activities at the brigade and divisional level on the various ed exercises like Maple Resolve and the Joint Texas series. Um, and I also spent five years working with influence activities task force. So one of the things about CCSB is that um, we either work together when we're at those headquarters or some of us have had the opportunity to work in different parts of the different units along the way. Um, it certainly gives us a uh, broad understanding of the capabilities of, of what needs to happen to enable our forces on the ground. So what drew you to working in electronic warfare? Um, when I first uh, joined the unit as a reservist uh, right from the start, I was actually a high school student and I was thinking about going to university and sort of deciding about whether I was going to you know, apply locally for Queens or go to RMC. And uh, a friend of mine was already in the unit, which had just stood up the year before. And uh, I was looking at what they were doing and the things they were doing. I said, well, this is kind of interesting. So I joined it when I was in high school. Um, thinking that, oh, the next year I'll move on to RMC and, and that'll be my military career and I'll have only spent a year with the unit. And I got to very interested in what we were doing because it was unique and ended up staying with the unit and then going through uh, education separately on my own as opposed to going the RMC in the full-time route. Um, and that's been a decision I sort of haven't ever gone back to. So you're talking about education and on that note, you know, what kind of person, uh, you know, in terms of soft skills and maybe life experience, do you look for in an electronic warfare soldier? 
So the, the SIGINT specialist is the primary trade and the regular force in the reserve that does most of the electronic warfare work. And it goes through the usual testing like anybody else would for a signals occupation in terms of the aptitude tests and everything else. What uh, is specific is that if you want to work and be successful in this area, you certainly have to be somebody who's a bit more of a self-starter than we might expect in some other areas. Uh, people need to be quickly trained and adaptable to work in small teams of two and three people. And, and in places like Afghanistan, you'd see those teams deployed quite separate from everybody else. And they're, they're just out there working with a, an organization that they hadn't been part of before. Um, and they need to be tech-friendly individuals. They're always going to be working with technology. They don't need to be programmers. They don't need to be other specific uh, um, sub-trades in the signals environment. But they certainly have to be very comfortable working on computers and with tech and antennas and power and generation and putting all that together uh, with a tactical goal in mind, not uh, just for the sake of the equipment. And what does the training look like? The training's broken up a couple different ways. Um, so there's the sort of background trade training that everybody takes, uh, which would be uh, the DP1 for SIGINT specialist is four months long. And once that training's been completed, uh, most operators, when they first come to the unit, have a series of other courses that they need to take before they get into the high readiness cycle, which typically takes about seven to nine weeks of additional training. Does that break into different specialties? Like I know different trades, uh, I'll talk infantry, for example, because that's my background, but, you know, you have people who go into jump courses or, you know, reconnaissance or something like that. Is there an equivalent kind of branch in terms of the electronic warfare world? There isn't a, uh, a long-term branch, so there's not like a managed suboccupation or something along those lines. Um, but what there is is a, a series of experiences where people have been and they've done different jobs and different experiences and they've had the uh, opportunity to go through managed readiness a couple of times in different roles and they've built up that sort of background experience to go through. Can you elaborate on what managed readiness is a little bit? So managed readiness is the Army's uh, set up for how it is that we prepare to go overseas and prepare people for deployment. Uh, for a unit like 21 Electronic Warfare and the other units in CCSB, often they're the only unit in Canada doing the particular role that they're doing. So they are always on the high readiness part of the managed readiness cycle, as well as force generating the people up through the preparation phases. So uh, we have three parts to the cycle. Uh, and with 21 EW, there is always different people at different parts of the cycle. So in fact, we're structured and organized to always deliver forces to be able to be deployed and also to support other people in their training areas as they prepare to go through. I think it's also worth talking about, because I don't think we talked about it up to this point in the podcast, that the Army typically operates, like you said, on a cycle, often referred to as PCF cycle or primary combat function cycle, where you go through the process of, you know, you deploy, then you come back, take a little bit of downtime, do some training, then do some mounting exercises and stuff like that to prepare to deploy, and then you kind of go through that cycle, and then different chunks are doing that at different times. So roughly the same concept. Uh, the same concept, and uh, 21 EW was specifically previously organized to do that in terms of we had three internal squadrons that were matched to each of the brigades, and they would sort of match what the brigades were doing in the high readiness cycle. Um, with the change recently to move to a six-month cycle, we've actually moved away from that um, so that we have units that are directly in support, and they will cycle people through more as individuals than as a whole unit in order to make sure we have the right numbers of people always ready to uh, meet the requirements of the Army. So coming back to the CCSB real quick, as it stands right now, CCSB falls under five division, which is headquartered in Nova Scotia. And here we are in Kingston, and we're talking about a lot of these moving parts. That's pretty dispersed for an organization that generally we might see concentrated in some space. Can you maybe talk about how that works and how it all kind of comes together? So when uh, CCSB was moved to five division, five division didn't have at the time a brigade, a full-time regular force brigade that was part of it. Uh, so five division uh, had CCSB given to it when it was stood up as, as the right place for it to be housed. Um, and it makes some sense because in also the engineer and the gun unit were already located in Gage Town. So they were located in five divisions AO as it went through. Um, CCSB, the other three units were already here in Kingston in their, in their, their nascent stages as they went. Um, so it made sense to make the headquarters for CCSB in, here in Kingston. So really in the two locations where they are, the int regiment is spread out in different uh, subunits across the country, but it's, they're not the prime unit, they're, they're subunits of it. So it's the command and control of it here all comes to Kingston as well. So it is interesting because there are people coming from different areas and, and, you know, the simple logistics of being a Canadian soldier of, okay, whose time zone <laughs> are we having this meeting in, yeah. <laughs> um, certainly becomes uh, an interesting thing because I just got an invite for, you know, a 7 a.m. web conference because it's on Newfoundland time and, and, and that's how that's going to work out. Uh, so it adds some, it adds some interest to, to planning and other organizations. 
but with the tech and, and everything that's in place, pre-COVID even, we're able to, to communicate daily as if the person was in the next office. Yeah, and I think we've definitely evolved a lot in terms of decentralized operations where we have those capabilities to kind of communicate with each other. And I know particularly the Army as a whole is moving forward on uh, operating in smaller or maybe a little bit more independent subunits that have that reach back capability to communicate with a centralized organization or headquarters of some sort. Do you have any uh, good stories you want to tell us about electronic warfare to like suck in all the people who are listening that, uh, you know, may want to jump in on this? Electronic warfare has been really rewarding for me, uh, especially for my time in Afghanistan when I was primarily, I was working in force protection. Uh, so I was doing a specific role of counter RCID. Um, and it was certainly quite a challenge to do that because it was a new capability that we were putting out at the time. And uh, to be able to take all the work and the time that we'd spent previously, I spent a lot of time doing uh, ECM roles previous to that. And being able to put all that together and work and do in Afghanistan was quite rewarding because we're able to say, you know, we did something, we achieved something, and it was quite measurable at the time. And that was a fantastic opportunity. One of the things about electronic warfare, because we can't tell everybody about everything that we've done and where it's been all the time, it's reassuring to know in different areas that you've had the work and the experience and that you actually knew or your unit or your command knew the results of what you were doing and could see it and the commanders could see it. And, and, and not always was it known everywhere else, but it was uh, well known and, and you were told it. And it was well worth to have known that. It's funny because it makes me think of, of conversations we have all the time, particularly about signals, where if signalers are doing their job right, nobody ever talks about them because the radios are working and everything's great. But the minute that that doesn't work, that's when you start hearing about it and people are like, oh, signalers. But really, it's just kind of the nature of working in the background and kind of ma just making sure everything's running nicely. You know, sometimes you don't necessarily get that recognition that you otherwise would get. And it seems like that's one step even further removed from that is because of operational security and different things. You're buried even deeper into that. And yet you're doing all these things in the background that probably contribute to the effort pretty dramatically, but people just don't really know about it because it's fairly uh, secretive, let's call it. Absolutely. <laughs> so understanding maybe operational security limitations, can you talk a little bit about the equipment, maybe not specific in details, but like where it all does, like how it all works? Well, certainly. I mean, uh, the job is to explore and exploit the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's intercepting radio communications and reporting on it. And, and I mean, that's no secret that that's what electronic warfare <laughs> yeah, does at its base. Exactly. So we can certainly uh, look at a number of different ways that's done. And there are certainly all different types of receivers and different computer systems that are used to control those and, and, and work in different types of environments against different targets. Um, how those are put together and how we network them and, and sort of the specific targets that we're going after is where it becomes, we can't discuss that with people and, and what the capabilities are and where they're going. But it's easy for people to see what they would do to start because if you look at how you would, you know, how do you listen to a radio station at home and, and you're just moving that up farther and farther and more advanced until you get to the point that you're doing electronic warfare. You know, what's interesting also is when you're talking about this, it makes me think of like certain domestic operations that I've been on or that I know people have been involved on and kind of the challenges of making sure we're not interfering with Canadians' privacy. A good example is we've had observation stations up in, in domestic exercises that have incredible visibility. They can see like kilometers out and stuff like that. Uh, and there's always the challenge of making sure that nobody's, you know, breaking privacy and like, you know, spying on somebody in their yard or whatever. I know that we go to great lengths to avoid that. How does that translate to the challenges of training for electronic warfare in Canada and kind of being able to exercise that without accidentally infringing on somebody's privacy or something like that? Well, at the heart of that is, is we do not intercept Canadians or, or look at their other activities or anything else. And, and the way that we train and prepare people is to go out and actually create all our own targets so that we don't have a situation where we're ever doing that. We just go out and, and, and create the target environment that we need to, to train for the skills that we need to prepare people for. So the electronic warfare regiment's out in the field in Wainwright and they're setting up to do an exercise. What does that look like? It looks like... Uh, it's us getting to be at the level four, level five sort of exercise where you've put all together, you know, we've done our sort of squadron level work beforehand uh, back in Kingston or with the brigade perhaps at their home station. Uh, when we actually get to Wainwright, we're able to put it all together and actually work in an environment where there's a lot more activity going on. We're certainly able to integrate the teams into their supported units and, and, and move them around and, and, and get to have that um, equivalent of the fire and movement in the electronic warfare world. It is a challenging environment for us and it allows us to do a lot of work where we bring together a number of targets that we produce ourselves and everything. So our, our, our guys are out 
there and able to work and be challenged and sort of have that difficult environment where they have to to really do um, the analysis to find the target and, and put it all together and provide a good product. As we look at, let's say, electronic warfare over the past 20 years, you have, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on the subject, but let's say you have various types of radio spectrums and things like that. Now we see ourselves in more of the digital age, let's say the past decade, there's an increasing amount of, let's say, digital tools, you know, things like drones and Facebook. Has all these things changed the way that we approach electronic warfare? And, you know, where do you see that going in the future? What is core for everybody to remember is if it's an emitter, it's an emitter. And if it's something that transmits as a radio, it transmits as a radio. And, and if it does it, it can be found. And there's no amount of technology that's ever going to change that sort of base piece in the, in the background. And, um, and that's how we look at it. We're locating signals. And if you have something that makes signals, we're out there to find it. You know, this reminds me of, uh, I think of like different situations, it, particularly the Americans. There, I, read a, I read an article about that where they discussed using detection to identify locations of soldiers just based on the electronic devices they were carrying. And it discussed kind of fairly elaborately how they would, uh, they would actually, before deploying on these exercises, soldiers would be pretty closely monitored for what electronic devices they were carrying and what they were allowed to bring into the field because their electronic warfare capability was identifying locations of individual soldiers and by clusters and things like that and compromising their security. What would you say to soldiers heading in the field? How can they prepare themselves to prevent being vulnerable while on operations? OPSEC is key, and uh, we certainly need to follow the plans that are put in place for particular operations and training uh, to make sure that what we're doing as individuals doesn't affect that OPSEC or what's going on. Um, so in different areas, that means that when we train, we really need to get used to training with the equipment we're supposed to be using and not that sort of friendly factor where people like carrying stuff around that is, is what they had before so that people are used to working with just the equipment they need and, and not bringing things with them that in fact would lead to OPSEC breaches and, and either because of the device and the emissions that are on that device giving away where you are or other things like how there's EXIF data with uh, locations that are tagged in it that later get posted on the internet and, and lots of stuff that's been in the media and the press that people have talked about and, and these are all real things that happen all the time and, and, and we all need to work to make sure that that stuff's not happening. That's a great point. Um, anything else you want to add before we wrap things up? One of the things that uh, sort of uh, we talk about how to become a member of the regiment, which was a, a question that uh, we talked about earlier. Uh, one thing that I didn't really mention or touch on too much is the fact that because we are both a regular and a reserve force unit, that people have a number of different ways to get to the unit. Um, regular force, of course, it's with the career manager and people come and go from the regiment a number of times in their careers based on their trades and, and, and what they're doing. Uh, but it's also because we have the, uh, the ability as a reserve unit to hire and take people in direct. We certainly bring people in uh, a number of different ways to the unit. There's the sort of traditional reserve hiring units. Uh, but one of the things that we certainly see a lot of is uh, component transfers, where we're getting people who actually have component transferred out of the reg force when they were perhaps unhappy with the trade they had before or deciding that it was time to switch to a more part-time environment and certainly took the opportunity to move to a trade that allowed them to participate in electronic warfare and in some cases even move to Kingston because of it uh, to get involved and go that route. Uh, and it's a very uh, sort of successful career path for a number of people. And um, another unique thing we have uh, is being a mixed regular and reserve unit is that uh, several people who component transfer uh, into the regular force from the reserve, in fact, are working with the same unit immediately after their component transfer or a couple postings later down the road. So we, we walk down the halls and, and we really are an extended family in terms of being both regular and reserve force. And it's the, the term of service they're working right now as opposed to the, how they identify in the long term. I like that you bring that up too, because if you look at kind of where the army's heading, uh, major changes are always a challenge within our structure and how we operate. But I know the army is working towards trying to make that barrier between, you know, component transferring from the regular reserve and back and forth a little bit easier in order to allow people to work with shifting priorities, you know, be it family or deployability and things like that. And so it seems like that's already a good starting point for trying to make that happen. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for uh, you know sitting through this interview and working with me. All good. Thanks a lot for having us out. That was Warrant Officer Chris Price from the Canadian Combat Support Brigade. And I'm Captain Adam Orton for the Canadian Army Podcast. Don't forget to check out our back catalog of episodes. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And as usual, stay frosty. Stay frosty.